So like you just said, I do a lot of work uh, around like UI animation and all of those things. You've probably heard me talk about it a lot. I decided years ago my job was to be annoying and make designers think about animation. Um, but today I wanted to talk about some other things that I think are super interesting and some places where I see not a lot of, a lot of design discussion, but a lot of design opportunities. So all of these things like VR, AR, chatbots, voice UI, all of those things, most of the conversations I ever hear about these are all about the tech side of stuff. It's all about like the hardware, the fancy GPU stuff, all the, all the super, super tech things. And it's rarely about design, which is kind of like, oh, but I'm a designer, so hey. And there's, there's a couple things these all have in common, all of these different technologies. They've all been suggested to be like the next big thing. We've all heard that like AR, or VR, or voice UI, or just you know, put a thing in there. It's the, ne the next big thing. They've also been accused of being gimmicky and like not having a killer app yet, which is like, oh, that's kind of sad. And I really believe that design is gonna play a huge role in how these things take shape, how they become part of our lives, if they become part of their lives. And whatever those killer apps are gonna be, design is gonna be part of it. Um, you know, these, all of these new technologies, these new mediums, there's a huge opportunity to apply design principles and design thinking to make them better and usable and all of those things. And then in a more selfish way, when I, when I look at some of these things, it's like there's so much opportunity for interesting design challenges and solving really like meaty and deep design problems, which is like, that's pretty great. I mean, that's the sign of stuff we want to work on. So the things I think that design can really bring to, to these, these technologies is, is a sense of humanness, a sense of empathy. And I think all of that, like we talk about that in screen design too, but it changes so much when we're talking about like other realities or things that work with voice. Um, you know, like finding some actual design solutions. I'm sure we've all seen like some voice apps or some AR apps where you're like, why does this exist? The answer is probably no reason. No one thought of a reason. We can think of reasons, good reasons. There's so much this technology could do to solve actual problems. And I feel like designers are going to be the driving force behind that. And then also this idea of connecting context. Because if you have a product, if you have a brand that exists on like a mobile app, on the internet, also is going to have to exist like in some sort of chatbot or voice UI or in VR and AR, all of those things need to be connected in some way. There has to be a story that touches all those points if you're going to be in all of those places and do it well. And I know a lot of designers are pretty good at that too. So let's talk about some of the specific tech stuff and we're going to start with chatbots and voice UI. It sounds cooler if you call it VUI, I don't know how you'd say that as a word. Uh, I did a little experiment recently where I made myself um, spend a whole week dealing with as many chatbots as possible. Uh, that was interesting. Um, but chatbots let us do things like talk to Flo from Progressive and Facebook Messenger. And, you know, she gets confused pretty easily, but she's got a lot of personality. Um, you can also talk to the Aflac duck, which disappointingly says words other than Aflac over and over. I know, right? It tried to, like, answer my questions. So I'm like, no, just quack at me. Oh. I have strange expectations. We can also text things, like this is one that Capital One has, uh, which is Eno. You can text um, this little bot about your account and all of those sorts of things and do all that kind of stuff with it. And I've noticed that there's some really interesting things around these, these bots. Um, a lot of them are trying to be like customer support bots, which to me feels like doing plays on the radio, right? Like they're basically the chatbot version of like, please pay attention as all our options have recently changed. Um, or if you're really lucky, it's one of the ones that's like a chatbot version of like, in a few words, please describe the problem you would like help with. You always know when people are talking to those things, they start yelling, they're like, operator, human. <laughs> and then like, we don't like those. I, I don't think it trans, I think like we could do more than that with chatbots. And I think a really big thing about them is this idea that they need to have personality. Like if we're talking to a thing, even if we know it's a thing and not a person, we expect it to have personality. We look for those things, and if your bot doesn't have personality, if you haven't designed a personality, it gets weird and feels kind of flat. Um, Booking.com wrote a bit about that when they were talking about how they discovered that if they didn't give their bot personality, and they were making a customer support bot, but that's okay. Booking, you know, we can, we can pay attention to just half the thing here. Um, they, you know, they found that if they didn't give it a personality, their customers still made one up, and they're like, oh, well, that's... Yeah, so giving it a personality, knowing what it's all about. But I think another thing that makes chatbots really useful, or it makes them more interesting and more like a thing you enjoy working with, is giving them some kind of specialty. Like these sort of like, um, 
just sort of uh, like general purpose, uh, like support bots, those are like, they don't, you don't know what you can ask them. They have like a strange kind of way to interact with them and they can't know everything and it can feel really weird. Like if you were like, my computer's not working and you're like texting with a bot, it's just never, it's a, just not a great setup. Um, uh, these chatbots and things that have a very special specialty purpose that are like a very narrow area of expertise seem to just feel a lot better to work with. For example, um, this is a bot I've been texting with quite a bit. Uh, it's uh, <laughs> one that like helps me save money, basically. It's digit. You can like text the little robot. It sends you gifts of robots, and it is a robot. Ah! It's the best part. You can even send it emoji, which I'm like, there's humans I text with that don't send me gifts, and I can't send them emoji. <laughs> so it's like that very like the way this is this particular one is built in such a way that it's like has a very narrow area of expertise, but it makes sense because it is a bot that's going to help you save money. So you talk to it about like the balance of how much you saved and all those kinds of things, which makes it a lot easier for that narrow interaction to make sense and still feel like a genuine interaction. So let's move on to voice things. Everyone loves voice UI. The fancy cylindrical friends that stay in our living room. That's what I like to call them. Um, and, and I feel like in a lot of ways we haven't quite figured out what to do with these yet. I don't know if you have any of these or how they work in your house, but generally for me we ask things like, hey Alexa, can you set a timer for five minutes? And Alexa's very helpful and it's like, sure. Five minutes, starting now. There's, not, there's really no timer, she's not here. Um, <laughs> or the, the second most common, actually, I'm, I'm pretending it's the second most common, but really the most common thing that gets Alexa get asked for in my house is like, Alexa, can you reorder some milk bones? Based on Val's order history, I found milk bone marrow snacks dog treats for all size dogs, 40 ounce. It's $7.75 total, including tax. Would you like to buy it? The only answer is yes. I mean, you can't not order your dog more treats. So I think it's very funny in a way that we have this fancy like voice assistant thing and the person, or I'm sorry, the being that benefits most from it is the dog. Uh, there's probably so much you can learn from that. But the thing about these is like, there's some things that are easier to do with voice. Even in those two interactions, setting a timer, super easy to do with voice. Me being like, hey Alexa, set a timer for whatever. Way faster than me digging around on my phone. Way faster than even setting one on this. Like that gets me there much faster. I get a timer, I can bake my cookies and everything is good. Um, things like, you know, even reordering a thing I've bought before maybe isn't easier on voice. Like, she kind of went on for an uncomfortably long time when I'm just like, just order the marrow snacks, the dog is hungry. Uh, like, I could have done that faster by just pulling out my phone or pulling out my laptop and just been like, you know, like one click purchase on Amazon or whatever I do. Um, and, and the kind of, the, the things that are easier in voice, like those are the things we should be looking at to create like voice driven apps to solve problems for. Things like when you're in the car and all of those things where those, that voice makes it easier and saves you time and like actually addresses a problem. And of course that changes with context. Like that buying stuff, reordering thing for me, I'm like, oh, I could have pulled out my computer faster. But I'm a person who has a, you know, lives in a house where there is a phone or a laptop or some other iPad thing within reach at all times. That's not actually normal, just so we all know that. Um, <laughs> but like, what if like, I had any sort of like, and I'm also like a perfectly like um, fully able body person that could walk over to that laptop or whatever, and I can see things that I have good vision. Like there's so many cases where that might not be the case, where actually, even though for me, that voice interaction takes longer, for many other people, it might actually be faster and a convenience they would like to have or they would choose to have. The one other thing that convinces me that maybe we haven't quite figured out what to do with all these voice assistants yet is that until very recently, one of the top apps in the Alexa skill store was a fart app. If you have children, do not tell them this, please, <laughs> for your own sakes. Um, a lot has been done, and I took this screenshot a couple of months ago, so uh, to their credit, they've done a lot to kind of better curate the Alexa skill store. Um, but there's still a lot of very repetitive skills, and I just every time I see it, I can't help but wonder, like, could we use this to solve some more interesting problems, some more like real design problems? I mean, and not to discredit anyone here who's made a fart app. I mean, that's how the iPhone app started, right? Fart apps and flashlights. So if you do want to like, dig around with some voice stuff, uh, they recently put out this uh, blueprint for Ele um, Alexa, and they actually kind of give you these stages. You can kind of fill in the blanks. It's like Mad Lib voice bot. It's pretty cool. And it's really interesting to see the structure they lay out for you, and then to try like writing words that are going to sound right to interact with when they're read out loud. It changes everything. Even if you're like a content strategist or write all the time, writing words to be spoken out loud is so different and super interesting. I made one for my pet sitter because, again, Alexa is all for my dog. 
One day, if she can ever like, understand barking or growls, I'm in so much trouble. I hope someone's working on that. Someone here, tell me you're working on that. All right, so let's dig into things that are maybe a little bit more out there and maybe even a little bit more kind of like thought of as, as like a gimmicky fad thing. So let's start with augmented reality, which I find this one super, super interesting because um, before doing this talk, I thought I'd like ask, just kind of do some really unscientific surveys essentially and ask some of my non-tech friends and family, because um, I still do have a few of those left, um, to ask them, like, have you used augmented reality? I actually asked them if they use augmented reality or if they use VR. And augmented reality, they almost all said no. They're like, oh, no, I've never used that. I don't know why they talk weird, but um, they're just like, no, no, I haven't used that. And I'm like, oh, really? Have you never backed up a car? And like, for all of the ones that don't drive or that haven't backed up a car, I'm like, I know you've done this. Like, I've seen you do this. So people are using augmented reality on their phones and like not even necessarily completely connecting that they're using augmented reality, which is super, super interesting from a design perspective. It's like, for somehow along the last few years, it's become totally natural to like pick up your phone and point it out to the world or point it at yourself and have stuff like superimposed on it. And like, that's okay to do. That's, that's a pretty big change. Um, of course, a lot of the kind of augmented reality, acts, uh, <laughs> augmented reality apps we see are kind of gimmicky and silly and maybe just kind of like feel like a place for silly games and not much more. But I think there's a lot of opportunity here to make things that are a little bit more meaningful and kind of address some specific problems. For example, anything that has like a spatial aspect to a problem, like will furniture fit in my room? How big of a box do I need to mail things? How far away is that person over there? Like those sorts of things can be very, very useful. Augmented reality can be very useful for. Um, and they can really like decrease the interaction cost of stuff like that. Instead of having to like go find a measuring tape, go find it, figure out where it is, walk back to the thing I want to measure, I could just use my fancy pocket computer phone um, and, and just measure it right there. Like that's pretty cool and futuristic. And there's just, there's a lot of places where that could help. Another place where augmented reality can even like make the UX of a tax, task even easier is like when you can minimize those attention switches. If you can hold up a phone and have it superimpose things over like the reality you can still actually see, like for example, like wayfinding or something, like you don't have to like pull up a map and then look at where you are or any of those things. You could just have it all right there in those various layers. Like that is super interesting. And there's so many places where that could be useful. Some examples of AR apps that I think are doing, doing stuff really well. Um, there's the IKEA Place app. Last night, I decided my hotel room definitely needed another side table. I mean, that giant space, what else are you going to do with that? I'm going to stick an IKEA table in it. That's what I'm going to do. Specifically, not that one, this one. I don't know, you have to scroll through them, even if you're going to pick the first option. And it mostly found the floor, and it dropped it, and I can move it around and like, you know, just kind of redecorate the hotel. It matches the couch, actually. I don't know if you noticed that. Picked it very, very purposefully. Another one that does, that kind of really solves that spatial, those spatial problems are things like the eBay app they um, uh, released recently, only for Android, though, where you're like, what kind of box would my stuff fit in that I want to sell to this person who bought it? That size box. Pretty cool. Couldn't do a video of this one, don't have an Android phone with me, that's okay. Plus I also haven't sold anything on eBay in many years, but that's okay. Um, so there, like, that's an idea. so a couple of apps that are solving some very interesting spatial problems that would be actually a lot harder to do without AR. And this really saves you that whole idea of the context switching, it makes that task so much simpler, you can do it right there. And you're like, ah, oh, useful, awesome. So some things that get interesting about AR is we essentially have to create, like almost think more like game designers. We need this sort of like heads up display. We need like these controls, but we also still need to see reality. And the reality part is actually the part we care more about, but we still want to be able to take action on things. So like that separation of the realness and the, and the actual um, interface are very different than when we're dealing with screens in 2D. We need to be way more realistic on your animations, and um, this is the thing I'm really picky about, obviously, based on the other stuff I obsess about. But like, you know, if that table, if, if it didn't have that like bounce animation, if I could like push it through the floor or something, it's suddenly the realness is lost, and we're not really gonna suspend our disbelief quite that far. Haptic feedback is also really useful, because right now the, the biggest, like most popular way we're using AR is holding up our phones. We have this like literal piece of glass between us and the, the like the reality we're trying to augment. Um, and we, so we end up doing things like we're always kind of pushing against the glass or like sliding and, and there's no like weight to these objects, right? So a little haptic feedback when you like drop that table or whatever makes it feel like it has weight. Even though we know it's on the table and we know it's pretend, it's just our brains do magical fun things. So to kind of look at that a little more carefully, like things like 
you know, this bounce, this kind of hit on the floor. And it's maybe not super accurate for the weight of that particular table, and honestly, all of the elements use the same animation to hit the floor, but that's okay, I'm not being picky or anything. Um, <laughs> but the fact that it does that, that it's like, this is floor, the floor is solid, it's like an agreement between you and this AR stuff that you're looking at that like, yes, the floor is solid, tables go on the floor. And you know, it, it's, there's all of these things that become, um, these little fine details become even more important because we know how things work in reality. And on 2D screens, we can kind of like fudge it around a little bit and just sort of like suggest real physics, approximate real physics. When we're saying this object is actually in reality with us, we need to be like way more exact and way more specific and way more accurate as how objects really move. So all the things around the shadow, around that little like circle of where it was going to be placed, all of those things are super important to make that experience good. And a lot of the time we're doing augmented reality on our phones, like I said, we can also do it in things like webcams with little markers. Um, this is a little experiment uh, Stella has been doing. She does some really amazing VR paintings, you should check out her stuff. And she was working to try out some VR things to see if she could get her, um, her AR things to get her VR paintings in AR, um, and it's pretty interesting. So it's not just necessarily on phone, we can have those markers and do it on webcams. Because the reason we can do AR on our phones is because we have all those fancy pants sensors, and those don't exist in all of the cameras we have on hand. So there's also a lot of opportunities around inclusivity and like inclusive design with AR. They, um, at Google I.O., they just announced a thing, I believe it was called Lookup, for like basically an AR app for blind people. It will announce what's around you. How cool is that? Like there's so much we can do with these tools and, the, and these technologies to like make life easier for people that are very different from us or maybe people we, we interact with all the time. So if you think AR sounds like a cool thing and you want to sound smart while talking about AR, my coworker Bushra, she's also a fellow Canadian, so you know she's super smart. Um, she wrote a whole series, I believe it's up to four parts now, all about like how to talk about AR, um, all the things you need to know to sound like a smart person when you're in those AR conversations, um, that the things you need to think about while you're designing for them and talking to engineers and that sort of thing. So really, really useful stuff. It's a great series. You should check it out. So let's talk about uh, some virtual reality next, because of course, if we've gone to augmented reality, the next step is clearly virtual reality. Virtual reality. Just kidding, that's not what it looks like anymore. Uh, this is 90s virtual reality. Aren't you glad we're not in the 90s? I would not, no, I would not wear any of those things. Um, <laughs> VR today looks a little bit more like this. And um, we sort of have kind of like two categories of VR right now. We have um, headsets sort of like this Google Daydream and the, some sort of Gear VR, one in the other side, um, which are basically give us like three degrees of freedom. So it's as if we're standing in place and the world is all around us and we can like turn around and like look around and do all of these things, but we can't like navigate the space. So it's kind of like it's in a big dome around you. I recently heard someone refer to these kinds of headsets as phone toasters, and I'm gonna use that word as much as I possibly can. Random aside, please do not put your phone in a toaster. That does not make virtual, well, I mean, actually, that could be interesting. Never mind. Um, so we have those sorts of headsets, and for the most part, those involve sticking your phone in a thing. Um, though recently, we've just had a couple of headsets come out, like the Oculus Go, that are these uh, three degrees in freedom headsets you can just pick up and stick on your head and then be in VR in like literally a couple of seconds. Really kind of changes the game. Then we have um, VR that's a little bit more like room VR, that's a little bit more like you can actually, you have six degrees of freedom, you can walk around a space, and those usually have some like two controllers instead of one, there's usually a bunch of wires hanging out the back, though that is changing pretty rapidly too. And these VR, all of these VR headsets essentially try to take you out of reality and into a different space. This is a little clip from a tilt brush um, ad if you haven't tried VR before. You essentially just like go into this big blank space where you can put anything around you and you can draw fiery lines. I like, personally, I prefer to draw glitter and tilt brush, but that's okay. I mean, clearly this commercial has a better artist than me in it. And these, these realities, these kind of this place we take people when we put on these VR headsets, despite the fact that like, we're not at like, the highest resolution we could ever be, like, you can still see pixels in VR, it's still, we know it's not actually real, but we can put things in these VR headsets on these screens and that, that seem real enough, um, so real that we have to remind people not to sit on fake couches. If you get a VR headset like the Vive or the Oculus, there's actually a pamphlet in there that tells you like, hey, don't sit on fake things. Also, make sure real things are out of your way. <laughs> and there's even a whole paragraph about don't step on your cat. <laughs> These are real problems. <laughs> it's true though, it's like, it takes you out of reality so much and even though it's not perfect, it's very convincing. And that's why I think VR is a really interesting place for things like inclusivity and empathy. We can convince people through VR that they are someone else, that they can experience things from a different person's perspective. That is so powerful and can have so many possible uses. 
We can like give people ways to create spaces. Think of all the things that require like like even just like decorating a house. You're like, oh, what would a table look like over there? We could make a VR thing of our house. Storytelling, super, super, um, a lot of opportunities there in VR of just telling a story. And it might sound like 360 video, you're like, oh, whatever, 360 video, who cares? Um, it, it really is so much more compelling than just like video on a 2D screen. I was one of those people, I'm like, I'm not gonna watch a silly story. And I'm like, ooh, this is interesting. <laughs> uh, I was convinced. And also things around our well being. If we can take people out of reality, we can make that space be a calmer, more beneficial space for them. Like our daily lives are super, super stressful. And for some reason, there's like just not a whole lot of like VR meditation apps. But I feel like that's like just the tip of the iceberg of the ways we can take people out of reality for ways that will like in increase or improve their well being and make them just healthier humans overall. So we have lots of things like stories. This is one that I did pretty recently. I went through, um, you follow this girl and her dad and, uh, and some goats, and you float around in this balloon to follow the story. Um, I'm a little afraid of heights. This was uh, slightly too convincing for me. Um, but you know, this, this participation in the story is so much different than just watching a video. Uh, it just makes things so much more, um, you just become part of it in a way. Um, the whole idea of like making this re pe taking people out of reality and seeming to like view things from someone else's experience allows the stuff like there's the whole I, um, whole industry or maybe not industry but a whole area of research around VR for therapy and I know it's hard to read because they really did not have a good type color choice but that's okay they do VR not type um, but people can do VR for like getting over phobias and stuff like you can have people in a virtual like theater to help get over their like fear of uh, speaking to crowds of the fear of heights and all of those things VR is convincing enough that we can like help people get over their fears in these very safe environments. Kind of further on that well-being sense, there's also things like this project that Frog did for burn victims. They created a, a virtual reality like experience to help people like deal with pain because be getting treated for burns really, really sucks and hurts a lot. And there's not a lot they can do with like medication to, to like treat that. But you know, Frog Design tried to give people an experience to take them away from reality, away from that pain, just temporarily, and it actually made people feel like feel less pain during those um, painful procedures. So there's a lot of power here that I feel like we're just getting to harness. There's also a really interesting article, if you're into all of this, um, that was out on The New Yorker a couple of weekends ago. And the headline makes it sound like it's about something else. But really what it, it, what it documents is one reporter's um, kind of um, experience working with some of these researchers and trying out some of the technology they've been doing in VR that makes you feel like you're embodying another person's body, therefore becoming like seeing experiences from their side of things, which is super, super interesting, I think. Like, if we can do that, oh my goodness, there's so much. I mean, there's also some bad, uh, um, some negative implications there too, right? Like, if you can convince someone that things are really, really real, what, like, you could make them, you could actually like hurt them too, right? Like you could make them believe they did something horrible and they would have that experience and, and that same thing as if it was real, which that becomes a little bit more of a thing. A little bit more of a different thing rather. So one of the things that I find really exciting about VR and that makes me think that VR might actually stick around is there is such thing as web VR. Like a lot of people are like, oh, we tried VR in the 90s, it didn't work. The headsets still look weird, so it's just not gonna happen. Um, but things are a little different from, the, uh, from them right now, besides the fact that that was like decades ago. <laughs> Other things have changed. We can make AR, uh, or VR rather, with A-frame, sorry, it starts with A, it's very confusing for me. I, I've limited vocabulary here. Um, <laughs> we, can, we can make VR with HTML and CSS in a browser. The stuff you make like web pages with, the, the same stuff you made your live journal with back in the day, you can make VR with. How cool is that? Going one step better, Mozilla is also starting, uh, recently started on this new project, which is called Web AR, or Web XR. It's funny when you see letters on screen and then you say different ones. That's a terrible, terrible habit. Um, but they're working on this idea of Web XR, which is essentially the thing they're trying to address here is like, hey, we have all of this hardware. We have like computers that can do like the 2D stuff. We can do AR. We have things that can do VR. What if there was a way to like have things that are viewable across all of those various bits of hardware, all of those various capabilities? What if VR and AR could be like a progressive enhancement of like your website? Which is a very, very interesting question. Um, and this article here is looking at exactly that. They're like, hey, you could have the 2D website version, then the like, you know, like the XR VR version where you can explore some space, or the AR version where you can like stick the pyramid thingy on your actual desk. Like, 
There's a lot of interesting things in that space. Um, so I think this is one to definitely watch. And uh, WebVR is also a nice place if you want to just kind of like dip your toes into making VR things. A-Frame is super easy. You can get some very simple shapes up and like make a VR thing in just a few minutes. And it's really cool to see your own stuff in VR. So VR is a thing you're, you're interested in. Um, there's a really nice guide here on Medium called The Comprehensive Guide to Getting Started in Virtual Reality. It is actually exactly what it says it is, which is sometimes odd for a Medium article. <laughs> You've read some of those too, where the headline, you're like, yes, and then you read it, you're like, no. Um, this one delivers. It is very comprehensive and a huge list of resources that way, of um, all the things you might need to know and do to get into VR and, uh, and you know, like start thinking of it from a design perspective. So I really encourage you when these things come up, when they come up at work or wherever else, and you know, try to like, get this conversation around design instead of just the technology. Talk about the problems it can solve, the, the design things we can do with it, the way we can take the design thinking we do every day and actually apply it to these new things. But I think the more we explore these possibilities of what, this, like, what this, these technologies can offer, the more we treat it as a design thing, the better things we'll be able to create. And I'm really excited to see what designers do with all of this new technology. So thanks so much for listening, and I'll be here all, all day and tomorrow to talk more about this. <laughs>